Okay, so let's talk about the mechanics of protein synthesis. Okay, so we have three major steps. You have the initiation, the elongation, and the termination. The initiation is the assembly of the initiation complex. The elongation is the adding of new amino acids on the sequence one by one. And the termination is the release of the completed polypeptide and dismantling of the ribosomal machinery. Okay. Scrolling on up. Oop, too far. Sorry, trying out a new camera and a camera recording software and it's different. Okay. Um, Okay, so in the initiation, the 70S initiation complex uh, is made up of the ribosome, the mRNA, and the formal methionine tRNAF, which is what you see here. Okay, so basically the chemistry of it, you'll notice that the tRNAF, which is distinct from the tRNAM, which is what you'll normally see, the, the formal methionine, excuse me, has a formal end which prevents the protein or prevents the amino acid from folding back on itself and potentially ending uh, the uh, sequence of amino acid chain building uh, before it's ready to be prepared. So what you see on the end there is uh, what you have is the tRNAF here, do to do, do obviously amino acid, carboxyl group, the amine group, hydroxyl, your side chain. And then your binding site to tRNAF. Okay, and so then that uh, is bound with the methionyl, uh, that is the methionyl tRNAF. And then uh, the N10 formal tetrahydrofolate uh, goes through what's called transformalase, um, which only recognizes the, the tRNAF, the, uh, the methionyl tRNAF, which leaves you with the tetrahydrofolate, which uh, which causes the tetrahydrofolate to come off, creating this additional bond that you see here, which is a formal methionyl tRNAF, thus the initiation or starting protein that you see there, or the starting amino acid. Excuse the wording. Okay, so how is translation... How is the translation start codon identified? Okay, so the first... First, the translated codon, not at the 5' prime terminus of mRNA and prokaryotic genes, are polycystronic. So uh, a single mRNA produces multiple proteins. So mRNA interacts with a small subunit. And uh, polygenic is another term for the polycystronic, you just want to keep that in mind. Um, and monogenic is what you'll generally hear for uh, eukaryotes. Okay, so you notice that uh, most most amino acid, most of the translations identified start codon by a shine de Garneau sequence, a purine rich region. So you'll see GGA or AGG, GGU, AGG, EG, like that. Um, of course, you know, they all start with uh, the AUG sequence, the methionine sequence, and then pairs with the initiator tRNA. Then that goes from there. Okay, so the 70S initiation complex. Let's get into a little, little bit more nitty-gritty of what's going on there. So the 70S initiation complex uh, factors, IF1 and IF3, prevent uh, dead-end assembly on the, in the absence of an mRNA. So it prevents the binding of the 50S if it's uh, not necessary for the production further. Okay, so the IF2 brings a tRNAF to the 30S initiation complex. The formal meth tRNAF is the only amino acyl tRNA that originally binds in the P position. So do note that. So binds there. So you have the 30S. Let's let's make sure we're going through where we're at. So the 30S ribosomal subunit plus initiation factors one and three uh, plus the formal methionine and an mRNA will obviously mRNA here. All of those will bind together on the AUG start codon. So the IF2, which as we should keep in mind is a G protein, um, stimulates the association of the large subunit to the initiation complex, which is the 50S subunit. This binding of IF2 causes the release of the IF1 and the IF3, and eventually the IF, uh, IF2 is also comes, comes off, and the GTP becomes GDP. Um, 
And uh, just of note, this ribosome complex is only assembled when the protein synthesis is needed. Um, so it's the, it's the release of energy from GTP to GDP, um, which allows the 50S to bind to the 30S complex there. So then in the end, you get the formation of the 70S initiation complex. And this whole bundling here is the rate limiting step in protein synthesis, so because it does take time and energy as compared to other things in protein synthesis anyway. Okay, so we covered initiation. Let's get into elongation now, which is the adding of um, new amino acids on uh, onto the protein one by one. Okay, so the elongation so is amino acid tRNA binding site A. Ta da! Binding site A. If you note, there are three spots. There's A site, P site, E site. I think we discussed that previously. So the R, TNA, uh, tRNA F is the only one that goes directly to the P site. Just keep that in mind there. So EFTU, which is a G protein, binds to a tRNA and make sure that the linkage um, with the amino acyl tRNA binding is uh, proper through GTP. Then the EFTU and the amino acyl tRNA binded, bound together, um, it will go to the A site on the 70S ribosomal unit. Now if the EFTU doesn't match, it will pull away from the complex um, and the GTP will be hydrolyzed to GTP energy used. So the second amino acyl tRNA is chaperoned to the A site by the elongation factor EFTU. So if the A site mRNA codon and the amino acyl tRNA anticodon form base pairs, the EFTU is released. It do, it, so, excuse me. So if the EFTU do match, it will pull away from the complex and the EFTU will be released. Ta-da! And then you'll have the binding there. Hooray! Okay, so further into elongation. So, you know, it's the EFTU with the GTP bound down on the amino acyl, bound to the amino acyl tRNA binding, which goes to the A site, and the EFTU is hydrolyzed to GD, GDP, and then the, <laughs> if, if binding occurs properly, the EFTU is released, EFTU becomes EFTU GDP, and the GDP is uh, released off the EFTS, which is a GEF protein for EFTU, goes on, it's, uh, it's an exchange, re releases the GDP for a GTP, and then we're back and it can bind for other amino acids. So just in summary there, the second amino acid TNRA shepherded into the A site by the elongation factor TU, EFTU. If A site mRNA codon, if the A site is correct, the mRNA code and the amino acid form the base pairs, the EFTU is released, and then it goes through this EFTU, EFTS complex binding sequence of re-preparing the G protein EFTU for another round of addition and amino acid fun. Okay, so then we get into what uh, is commonly known as the peptide bond formation. So just of note again, the first amino acid is protected by the formal, thus the F, formal methionine. Okay, so the amine of the A site amino acid attacks the ester linkage between the initiator tRNA and the formal met initiator tRNA and the formal methionine in the P site to form the peptide bond. Um, the peptide grows into the tunnel, so there's a little tunnel here, and those two are bound together. And this causes a shift, a movement, if you will. The tRNAs transfer over one space each from the P site of the formal methionine tRNA to the E site and then of the secondary tRNA bound uh, amino acid moves to the P site. Hooray! Okay, so let's get into the nitty-gritty of the mechanics of peptide, wow, mechanics of the peptide bond formation. Okay, so the tRNA in the P site is attacked by the tRNA in the A site, which causes the release of the hydrogen, and its uh, nucleophilic amino group is displaced near the ester group 
to produce an amino acid or the peptide bond, which is what you see here. So this comes in, whoop, pshoo, kicks off the tRNA, tRNA, pieces out, and then you have the NH group, the amine group, on your next amino acid bound there on your previous amino acid, which is what you see here. So this creates sort of a partial double bond characteristic. Um, this peptide bond creates a partial double bond characteristic. So this is a dipeptidyl tRNA. So that's what you end up with there. Okay, a little bit further down there. Yep, just of note, that is the peptide bond. So we're just keep, keep scrolling through that. And then, as I've kind of been alluding to previously, the f uh, purpose of the methionine formulation. So the N formulation of the initiator methionine converts its terminal amino group into an inert amide, otherwise known as the N-terminal amine. Uh, otherwise, no, otherwise, the N-terminal amine could attack the ester linkage between the amino acid number two and its tRNA, thus cyclizing and terminating synthesis. So in theory, it could come back around here and hit on the backside where normally the second amino acid would bind, which causes a cyclical linkage, and doom and gloom would presume to resume. Um, and what you'd see is the cyclic molecule, and it would just break and everything. It, it'd all go wrong. It'd all go wrong. Everything would break. Okay, so now that we understand that everything will break if something doesn't work properly, um, we can talk about translocation. So, biggest thing about translocation is make sure you know which direction the G proteins came in, which order. Then, you have the protein elongation factor, G, which is EFG, binds to the ribosome. The hydrolysis of GDP, GTP on EFG to GDP causes a conformational change that sterically excludes the peptidyl tRNA from the A site. So everything gets moved over. The association of mRNA moves down one codon, and the deactivated deacetyl tRNA moves to the E site. So deacetyl acetyl doesn't have the amino acid anymore. You'll notice that there. Everything else has moved down one. You have a new bond site there. Okay, so the elongation continues. Um, the resetting of the ribosome. So the G protein is always recyclable. So the GTP there is hydrolyzed to GDP and the EFG. Wow, this is really lots, a lot of acronyms there. So the, those two dissociate, and the deacetyl de tRNA resets ribosomes so that the next amino acid can be added. So that comes in, kicks everything down one, moves the whole complex down one coding sequence. So the elongation cycle continues until a stop signal is reached. On the topic of stop signals, da -da -da -da, we come to termination, which is the release and completed Polype release of the completed polypeptide and dismantling the ribosomal machinery. Okay, so termination. What you see here is fairly complex just to look at. We can work through it together. So for stop codons, there are no tRNAs for stop codons. Instead, there's releasing factors which bind to the stop codon in the A sites, so which you see here. UAA, UGA, UAG, which are the stop codons, obviously, as represented. Um, in your amino acid sequences. So, releasing factors may carry a molecule of water which hydrolyzes the peptidyl RNA ester bond, releasing the peptide. It attacks it right there. And another release factor, ribosome releasing factor, RRF, and an EFG dissociate the ribosome mRNA complex, mRNA tRNA complex. So, ribosomal releasing factor. EFG and GTP all split the complex back into its relative 50S and 30S subunits with a free-floating tRNA, free-floating mRNA, and your newly created polypeptide, which is also free-floating at this point. <laughs> okay, so a release factor visualized. Uh, structure resembles tRNA, but it carries a water molecule which hydrolyzes the ester linkage between the tRNA and the amino acid in the P sites. So this water molecule here, <laughs> the water molecule here, um, goes into the P site, hydrolyzes the ester linkage between the TRA and the amino acid in the P site, which folds it over and prepares it for stopping. Okay, so in summary, protein synthesis is controlled amide formation. 
Essentially, you have the ester, which becomes an amide, and it just goes further and further and further, links and links and links and links, tons and tons of those until it's happy and satisfied with what it's doing. So the ester linkage of amino acid and tRNA, amino acyl tRNA, and the EFTU protects the ester linkage during delivery of amino acyl tRNA to the ribosome A site. Okay, so again, protein synthesis is controlled amide formation. tRNA structure and charging. We've covered prokaryotic ribosomes and protein translation. Oh my goodness, we're about to get into eukaryotic ribosomes and protein translation, so we'll stop here and call that a video.